Welcome back to the Diet Doctor Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Schur. Today, I'm joined by Diana Rogers. Now, if you haven't met or heard of Diana Rogers, you need to because she's spreading a message that I think everybody needs to hear. Now, Diana is a registered dietitian and a farm owner and an author and a podcast host and now a movie producer. She's recently coming out with Sacred Cow, The Case for Better Meat, both a book and a documentary. So much of the discussion around meat seems to be we need to either go meat-free, completely vegan, or continue with our current system of meat production. And she's saying, no, there's a middle ground. There's a case for better meat raised in a more sustainable way that's better for the environment. And of course, for our health, uh, it, it seems pretty clear that meat is beneficial for our health uh, in so many ways, both in the U.S. and uh, in the world, um, in developed countries, in undeveloped countries, and how our attention sort of needs to shift from just creating more calories, producing more calories, to producing more nutrients and doing it in a way that's sustainable for the environment, sustainable for health. I think this is such an important message and really um, is more important now more than ever because of COVID-19 and coronavirus and what that has told us about our food system and the food delivery system, but also the the increasing wave of um, meat antagonism, whether it's from documentaries or whether it's from opinion pieces in the New York Times and The Guardian. And um, they're really not based well on science and reality. And that's why um, this uh, this other view that Diana has is so important on, on how this can be done. Now, it's not without its problems, though. Um, you know, how do you get started? What are the costs of it? Is it something we can do at large scale? And we address all these because these are so important. So this is such an important message. And I really hope you enjoy this interview with Diana Rogers. Well, Diana Rogers, thanks so much for joining me on the Diet Doctor podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you. I was lucky enough to interview you for the Low Carb Cardiologist podcast years ago. And since then, a lot has changed. You've been you've been really busy, still working on your farm, still working as a dietitian, but now with your new book, uh, Sacred Cow, and your documentary. So, give us a little bit of your background on how you got to this point and what made you so passionate to to write this book and and make this documentary. Sure. Um, let's see. So I um, I was diagnosed at twenty six with celiac disease. And, um, but prior to that, I was really interested in farming. It was my summer job all through high school and college. And, um, I was always very interested in food. And when I first went gluten-free, it fixed a lot of things, but I still had some blood sugar, you know, management issues. And it really wasn't until I went kind of low carb paleo that, that all kind of got resolved. And so I decided to change my career, become a dietitian. And meanwhile, I've lived on farms for the last 18 years. And so I started noticing that most of the people that were arguing for a sustainable diet were pushing for a vegan or vegetarian. And, you know, when you look at eating in an ancestral template, like pre-agriculture, then when you apply that to how we grow food and think about like what's the healthiest in a evolutionary biology context, it makes a lot of sense that um, the right way to grow food is not our industrial food system. It's actually a totally different model that includes lots of grazing animals, um, some vegetables, basically everything that um, folks in the real food movement advocate for. So not a vegetarian, vegan type diet. And that's what I think is so unique about you and really puts you in the best position to do exactly what you're doing. Cause you have, you know, both the health standpoint from personal experience and as a registered dietitian, as a clinician, and now you also know the environmental side and the practical side because you work on a farm. And I think that's part of the the disconnect that we have is that so many people don't have that combination. Most people either know the health side or they know the agriculture side. And most people who are advocating for a certain type of diet have no idea where food comes from or, or what it takes to get it there or what the impacts are. And I think you're really doing a great job trying to bridge that. And that's what I like so much about your, 
your tagline, the, you know, uh, the case for better meat? Because the argument seems to be no meat or our current system of meat. And you're saying, hold on a second, there's a middle ground there. So tell us what, what that middle ground is and tell us about why, you know, why that dichotomy is so strong. Well, so just like when we talk about, um, you know, the, the studies against meat and how there's, you know, funny methodology, but it gets reported by the media as fact, but really it's these observational studies uh, with very poor methodology, you know, looking at food frequency journals, which are lies that people <laughs> report down um, on the paper. The same thing can be um, applied to the studies ag against meat. So when, for example, we look at the water footprint studies uh, that say like, you know, it takes 10 bathtubs full of water to produce one pound of meat. What they're not telling you is that the methodology that they use to calculate that water is actually flawed. So it's mostly green water, which is rainwater. So even in typical beef production, 94% of the water footprint is actually rain or moisture 94%. that's already. Yeah. Wow. Um, so when in grass fed beef, it's 97%. So really, we should be looking at what's the blue water footprint. So blue water is um, aquifers and lakes and groundwater reserves. And so we should be looking at, well, that's the water that is wasted. Um, and so when you compare the blue water footprint um, to, on beef, even typical beef or even better grass-fed beef, to foods like avocados, sugar, walnuts, um, so many other foods, rice, Actually, beef is a way better, um, you know, more efficient use of water and more nutrient dense. I mean, comparing beef to rice or, you know, even with land use, it's like, well, we could grow this many potatoes or this much corn versus, you know, only one cow per acre or something like that. It's, it's a little flawed because we're not actually comparing nutrient density. We're just comparing like pounds of food. So we have no problem producing calories or pounds of food. We have a problem producing nutritious food in this country. Right. And your documentary actually goes through that very well, that talking about how, you know, World War II, the goal was more calories. How do we just produce more calories for a country that needed that? We solved that problem. Put the check mark by it. Now we have too many calories. We need better nutrients. And I, I really like that that argument or and that statement because it it really kind of opens your eyes. Oh yeah. So so Part of what you're, or the big part of what you're recommending then is a better way to raise cattle for better nutrients and better environments. So you talked about water. Another part that was in your documentary that was such a great visual was how they have sort of traditional monocropping um, and, you know, uh, simulate rainwater and the, the ground didn't absorb hardly any of the water. But then this regenerative agricultural um simulate rainwater there and it really just soaked up so much water so it's making better use of the rainwater so tell us tell us what is regenerative agriculture and and how it's good for the soil and the environment so the idea behind regenerative agriculture is really looking at a model that improves land that actually builds upon it so it's sort of you know a lot of people say well it's even beyond sustainable or it's beyond organic but it's really at the heart of what organic and sustainable you know, agriculture was when it first started, it just kind of, those terms got co-opted by food industries and now mm -hmm. everything is sustainable. And I'm actually even going to conferences now and seeing regenerative cashews imported from who knows where, you know, in plastic packaging, but it, they're regenerative, you know? So, uh, it's, it's even happening now with the word regenerative, but the, the concept behind it is that this is an agricultural system that works with nature, not against it. It uses, it requires animal inputs because there are no ecosystems in the world that um, don't have animals. And um, so we actually need the, the impact of animals. We need their browsing. We need their pooping. We need their um, being on the land um, in order to actually build topsoil and um, it can sequester carbon. Um, and we actually, you know, one big criticism is, well, that's great. And there's been a couple of studies that prove that this is happening, but, you know, can this be done at scale? And so we do go through the numbers in the book and look at all the under underutilized land in the United States. Um, 
There's a lot of conservation land that currently cannot be grazed that the government is is um, in control of. There's a lot of private property that's uh, not being grazed or is being undergrazed. And so, um, and there's a lot of ethanol production, which takes fossil fuels to make. It's completely inefficient. And so if we got rid of ethanol and if we um, imply, uh, you know, started improving the land with regenerative techniques where um, the carrying capacity of the land, the amount of animals that it can actually support increases um, along with the soil health, we actually have enough land in the U.S. to grass finish our entire beef herd. And um, as you saw in the film, we go down to Chihuahua, Mexico with ranchers that are regenerating a million acres just with cattle. So it's this is land that used to be grasslands and is now turned into just barren desert with this hard pan. Do you remember him like showing this? It's like a concrete layer on the soil where the water can't even penetrate at all. Um, but when we have the cattle's hoofs, you know, walking on it, they break up that hard pan, they're adding moisture to the land and they can actually create habitat for birds. Um, that one rancher, Alejandro, is actually working with multiple bird organizations that are so excited that he's creating better habitat for migratory birds and very rare birds. And so um, this is a system that can be used in many places where you actually can't grow crops to begin with. Most of our agricultural land can't support crop production, but can support grazing. Yeah, it's a great visual how barren that that landscape is. And then what they can do with it to to regenerate it and revive it. And and so that's that's part of the question though, is is how can people do this? How can farmers do this? Because um I, I saw the the biggest little farm, um, that documentary, which was I thought amazing. It was beautifully done and really, really poignant, but but it looked hard. I mean, it looked like a big challenge for them to get started. And they had investors and they had, you know, it was expensive and, and it was I mean, they really struggled. So can the average farmer make the transition from what they're doing now to to having this regenerative cycle where they're taking care of the land, it's better for the environment, it's better for the animals, um, but are they going to survive? Can they do it financially? Yeah, so there's sort of two ways that this could happen. One is top-down, getting rid of crop subsidies, which guarantee farmers an income whether, you know, before they're corn is even planted. I mean, that system is wrong and needs to stop. Um, and, and then also, you know, incentivizing farmers, uh, actually building in the costs to, um, you know, the environmental destruction is not paid for by those farmers who are ruining the land, but the farmers like us who are actually improving the land aren't being compensated, um, by anybody to improve the land. Right. Um, but then on the farmer end, they need more access to education. There's a great group called the Savory Institute, which actually does um, education in this technique. Farmers can start small. They can, you know, hey, just start with a small section of your land and just just watch how this is actually going to help you make more money. Um, so there's a lot of organizations that, you know, will say do this for the environment. But I actually think that we need to talk to farmers about how are you going to save your farm? How are you going to leave a legacy for your family, for your children? Um, and how can you do this while improving the land and making it a system that is still going to be here in a thousand years? Um, so we need more consumers, uh, you know, regular people who aren't farmers to appreciate this, to understand that it does cost the farmer more because um, they're actually absorbing all the costs to improve land where the farmers that are destroying land are not absorbing those costs. So we need more appreciation. We need folks to stop, you know, expecting chicken to be a dollar a pound or $2 a pound um, and actually support the farmers that are doing the right thing. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's a great point, but also presents a challenge. So um, people who are, who can shop at their, you know, local farmer's market or go to their local butcher um, and can shop small scale and more expensive, that's great. But then how do you extrapolate that to, you know, the poorer areas of the country where they don't have that access, where they don't have the money? So for those people, I mean, maybe we still need some factory farming that it can't completely go away. How do you balance that? Yeah. So um, that's why in the book, we actually make the case that meat is a healthy food, period. So even if you can't, don't have access to, you know, the, the most beautiful grass-fed beef, 
that doesn't mean you should go eat a bagel instead, right? Um, so a doctor would never go to their patient and say, well, only eat organic vegetables or don't eat vegetables. And so I feel like as a dietitian, I can't ethically say only eat grass-fed beef or eat pasta instead, right? Eat, eat this, you know, Beyond Burger, which is actually, Beyond Burger is twice as expensive as organic grass-fed beef. Um, so yeah. we need to stop kind of glorifying these plant-based proteins because they're not as nutrient dense. But they're being marketed as better for the environment, right? So, but exactly. it's exactly the opposite because they don't take into account the the damage to the 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 earth that is being done by the monocropping and then all the processing and the fossil fuels that go into it. And so it really is sort of an unfair comparison. But here you're saying it's worse for the environment. Then regenerative ag, I totally agree. And right. even in factory farmed factory farmed animals when it comes to beef it's very different process than chicken or pork so chicken and pork eat 100% grain their entire lives in an industrial system they're you know indoors in cramped conditions um, these chickens that are that everyone's getting at the store for you know mo no money um, they will die at five weeks if you don't kill them first they're not even an actual animal they're just this weird like proteins on sticks kind of thing but it's seen as a better choice than beef necessarily and it that's not true so beef is um, more nutrient dense than chicken or pork by about 30 percent environmentally Cattle that are finished on feedlot are still only getting about 10 to 13% of their overall diet from grain. So the rest of what they're eating is grass on land we can't crop because cattle all start out on grass. Um, when they're at a feedlot, they are getting some corn, but they're also getting, they're upcycling things like uh, spent grains from the alcohol industry, um, uh, from the ethanol industry, all the corn husks. So cattle can actually upcycle all those foods that would, you know, sit in a pile and decompose and emit greenhouse gases if we didn't run them through a cow and, you know, turn them into protein. Um, and so it is a pretty efficient process. Um, and not all feedlots are like torturous places. The cows can still like move around. And, you know, I've seen some really nice feedlots, but I'm not saying that, you know, I'm for feedlot cattle necessarily. I'm just saying that it's um, it's not black and white. This is a highly nuanced topic. And I think that if somebody, you know, is living in an inner city, they don't have access to go to a farm to buy, you know, upfront half a cow from a grass fed farmer, um, and they want to give their child a leg up in life, that kid should be eating meat instead of um, a lot of, you know, mac and cheese and, and a lot of the other less nutrient dense foods. So, and, and that actually has science to back it, right? Wasn't there a study that was actually a randomized controlled trial um, looking at kids and those, and those who didn't eat meat and those who did eat meat, the ones who did were the ones who scored better on their tests and had better focus. And I don't remember the details. You probably know better than I do. Can you tell us about that study? Yeah. So there's only been one um, randomized control trial on kids, um, looking at this. So it was a group in Kenya who were food insecure. Um, and one, you know, they had a baseline diet. It, it did contain a little bit of meat. Um, and so it wasn't like no meat versus all meat, but there was a, one group that got a meat substitute, um, a, not a substitute, a meat supplement, you know, so extra meat. One group got just extra calories and one group got extra dairy. And the dairy group actually did the worst even worse than the extra calorie group. And I think that that shows that, you know, it, it's not necessarily a good thing to substitute milk, which is what they're doing in a lot of African countries. They're just, you know, this milk, meat is expensive. And so they're just giving these kids milk. But as you know, um, milk inhibits iron absorption. And so that's what kids need to grow. Um, and so the, the group that got the meat, um, the extra meat, did better academically, behaviorally, and physically than all the other groups. And then it was the extra calorie group, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's such a good point that, you know, we, like, we have the luxury to be able to say, you know, we have the luxury to be able to say, oh, you know, we don't need meat. We can live without it. Well, is that really true? I mean, what does that mean from a health standpoint, from a, a mental health standpoint? And what does it mean for the rest of the world too, who are more food insecure? And I think that's the power of that kind of a study to say, wait a second, um, that, that we can't actually do this. Yeah. And there's definitely also places in the world where you can't crop. 
um, like a, a lot of really dry areas or they're too hilly or too rocky where only grazing animals will thrive. And there's also a lot of places where women can't own land, but they can own livestock. And so we have to take that into account. And, you know, these global recommendations that everyone in the world necessarily needs to be eating less meat is actually, I think, from a social justice perspective, really damaging to um, a lot of people. But even in the U.S., I think it's damaging because um, there's there's a lot of people who are food insecure. And what I was going to mention is that here in the Boston area, we have, you can use your um, EBT, you can use your food stamps at farmer's markets. And they did a special program where you could get an extra 40 to $80 per month or per week. It was like a lot of extra money that you could spend, but it was only on fruits and vegetables. It was not on meat. One thing that New England does really well is grow grass. And so to tell people that, you know, their $6 pint of organic raspberries is a healthier choice than some locally produced grass-fed beef, you know, is to me, it makes no sense at all. If we're trying to nourish people, if we're trying to, you know, fill the bellies of people that are food insecure, or even try to help people who are suffering from obesity, diabetes, and, and other things to be um, restricting the meat and and yet telling them that, you know, organic mescaline mix and, and raspberries and apples are, you know, what they should be buying more of instead of locally produced meat, which we have tons of here in New England. Um, I've got a huge problem with that. Yeah, that is so frustrating to hear. And it comes from the government, which is, which is educating themselves on sort of poor scientific studies and probably from hearing a lot of the propaganda that's out there. I mean, there's been such an anti-meat push in the past couple of years, whether it's been Eat Lancet. And now even in the past month, there's an op-ed in the New York Times and then one in The Guardian. And there, I mean, there's, it seems like such, of a, such a, a huge push. So um, I want to get into those op-eds. But the other question is, what can somebody do? Like if, if they're in New England and they're on food stamps and they can't use it for meat, like what, what can people do to try and help educate others or to try and make a difference? So, I mean, the WIC program is really um, unfortunate because you can't get meat products on WIC. Um, which is just, so that's women, infant, and children. And, and we know in those first 1,000 days is the most critical time to get those important nutrients in. And we just, you know, there's nutrients in meat that and animal products that you can't get from plant-based products. Um, there's actually no vegan approved formulas on the market because the FDA won't approve them because it's not safe. Um, and so, again, I think that people just need to figure out what, what their skill set is and how they can get involved. So for, you know, we've hosted CrossFit workouts on the farm where people are doing actual farmers carries with buckets um, right. and just, you know, getting them involved. And maybe, you know, they can, instead of working out in a gym, um, they can actually go dig some holes on a farm or help a farmer out. Um, maybe someone can make a website, you know, if, if they're not uh, able to work on a farm, most farms accept volunteers um, if someone, you know, is, is involved in policy, making sure that animal products are actually at the forefront and center of, um, of these initiatives to try to feed people. Um, there's, you know, there's still great programs, for example, in the Cambridge public schools here in the Boston area, they're using old dairy cattle as the burger meat. Um, and so New England dairy, you know, cattle, you know, have their life as dairy cattle, but then we can, you know, eat them. And a lot of our ground beef in the country is from, um, called dairy cows. And so, um, there's that. So I just think, um, you know, there's things people can do individually. And it's funny cause the book we, um, we, Rob and I turned in the book before coronavirus even happened. Right. Um, and I went back and I looked in the book and, you know, uh, in addition to what we can do to like save the food system, we also included things like, don't get yourself into debt, you know, like in case something happens, don't get into debt. And we're seeing this now, like, don't be a burden on, on society, keep yourself healthy. So you're not a burden on our healthcare system. You know, um, it's, you know, when we talk about the environmental footprint of food, I think we also need to be looking at the environmental footprint of things like diabetes, you know, with all of those lancets and all the plastic involved, amputations, hospitalizations, 
uh, dialysis. Think of all the plastic involved in dialysis, right? right. Um, and so I actually did look at that in the book and kind of, you know, sketched out, you know, some things. And so uh, we want to try to avoid diabetes and heart disease. And we can really do that through an optimal diet, which is, you know, basically the diet uh, you know, we have a diet challenge in the book, which is like a Nutribor diet. And, um, it's basically a real food diet, like, like most of us recommend. Um, but when you take the emotion out of it and you just look at nutrient density, it actually lines up perfectly with what's most sustainable. And, you know, it, it's, you know, seafood, meat products, uh, leafy greens and fruits. And, you know, I mean, that's it like grains, um, Actually, nuts and seeds too aren't as nutrient dense, and they're not as great for the environment as um, you know. Just getting your your uh, nutrients from animal products. So you mentioned taking the emotion out of it, and that's it, even though it's so hard to do. But um, that's what we've seen so much of lately is the emotion behind um, the push for no meat, and is from a health perspective, which we we've, we've covered a lot uh, on this podcast and at Diet Doctor. It's from the environmental perspective, and we just had Frank Mitlerner on, who I know you know well, and you've had him on your your show. He's wonderful, and your book covers a lot about the environmental aspect. And then there's the ethical aspect, which is something we haven't touched on a whole lot here. And I find that so interesting. And um, you have uh, Lear Keith in in your documentary who talks a lot about the ethics. But one of the the lines that I've heard you say before that I enjoy so much is there there's no food without death and funny to say I enjoy that because it's about death, but it really makes the case that um, it, it, we they portray it that the vegan way is is like the, the, the best way because nothing dies. We don't harm anything. And that's still so far from the truth, but, but that message gets lost. And, and it, I, there's such a disconnect there that I have a hard time with that people can be so passionate about no death, but then not see the death that happens um, to produce their own food. So what have you learned about that through this whole process? Yeah. So I've talked to tons of vegans. I've talked to philosophers that are, that are vegan. Um, I've talked to just so many different people about this and I've really looked at the idea of the sentience and least harm and intent and, you know, what is a diet of least harm and, you know, on the sentience, um, topic, you know, the idea that we shouldn't, we shouldn't um, cause harm to an animal that can feel, uh, but yet a plant can be can be killed because they can't feel. But you know, I challenge you know a three hundred year old maple tree that might be habitat to thousands of critters and provide shade and provide important ecosystem functions. Is is the life of that tree less important than a three day old field mouse that's about to get eaten by a you know coyote? Like I just you know, everything is intertwined and I don't see a hierarchy. Um, it's, there's just threads and it's a food web. It's not a pyramid. Um, but we have, you know, really divorced ourselves from our role in, in the world as animals. Um, and so I think a lot of this comes from just a fear of death and not wanting to admit that death happens and thinking that death is sort of like a linear, like at the end of the line, instead of, you know, death, decomposition, life, death, decomposition. And it's just, it's just a, you know, transfer of molecules basically. Um, but especially Americans, you know, um, only about 30% of us have wills. Um, we don't want to think about death. We're very scared of it. Um, you know, so even in the health space, longevity, right. That's a big thing. Like, how can I cheat death? And it's like, mm, it's going to happen, you know? And so that's where like a lot of these meat restriction diets for longevity, I have an issue with sometimes because I think that we need to be robust and healthy as long as we can, not just live as long as we can. Um, sarcopenia is like, a real thing that happens <laughs> that, right. um, you know, people get weak and they fall. And, you know, so I, I just don't think it makes much sense. We lose our ability to, uh, break down protein as we get older. And so we, our protein requirements goes way, way up as we get older. Um, and then from the least harm perspective, uh, you know, that's quite noble, right? I want the least amount of harm to happen for my life. And I, I definitely feel that way too, but in a regenerative system, 
where you have cattle that are actually increasing biodiversity. So increasing the number of plants, the number of microorganisms underground, the number of pollinators and birds and fish in the streams because they're, you know, it's not a toxic system. Um, you know, one large ruminant from that type of a system that actually increased life can provide almost 500 pounds of food, right? Um, so if you compare that to extractive agriculture, and we actually have a great um, graphic about this in the film where we show, you know, regenerative versus extractive agriculture. Can you define extractive agriculture just for people who don't know? Yeah. So uh, I refer to industrial monocrop agriculture as extractive because it's just pulling and pulling and pulling and we're not replenishing it. So it's like a bank account that we're just drawing from. We're living on credit, which kind of is the American way, right? Like let's not save for the future or improve things. Let's just live it up for today and not even think about the consequences that are down the road. Right. Um, so, so if we're looking at, um, you know, a typical American diet, even if it doesn't have meat in it, um, I mean, even on an organic farm where we're not using chemical pesticides, we're still using organic pesticides. We still want to prevent, you know, we're, we're, we have ladybugs that are eating insects. We have praying mantis here. So there's death that's happening um, we don't want bunnies in our fields. Like no organic farmer actually wants bunnies jumping through our field. So we're going to get rid of the bunnies. Um, uh, we're going to get rid of the deer because we have a huge salad bar for the deer here and we need to make a living on our vegetables. And so, um, even in the film, we talked about like, did Bambi die for your lettuce? Probably, you know? And so, um, I think we just need to accept that all, eating causes death and all living causes death. And so all we can do is make sure that that death is actually part of a system that improves life, that we take responsibility for that death and try to make sure that it happened in the most humane way possible. Um, dying in nature is not just, you know, curling up and dying in your sleep. It's actually quite a violent process. If anyone's ever watched anything on National Geographic, they've seen how animals die. I mean, you get eaten alive, you, you know, get stranded because of a broken leg and those animals swoop in and, and turn your flesh into their flesh, right? That's just how it happens. And so um, if I, as a farmer, can increase ecosystem function, improve the, the vibrancy of my farm, grow amazing vegetables, um, you know, that's a win for everybody, whether or not they even want to eat vegetables. So I have no problem if someone chooses, um, or I'm sorry, whether or not they want to eat meat. Um, I have no problem if someone chooses not to eat animal products for whatever, you know, personal reasons. Um, but we can't grow vegetables without animal death. It's actually completely impossible. Yeah. I think that's such an important perspective that, that people need to hear more of. And it, it really is the whole circle of life, the way you described it. And it's kind of cheesy, but it reminds me of that Lion King song about the circle of life, but it's true. I mean, that's really, that's really what it is. And, and it, and it's about being part of nature rather than just taking from nature. And I, I like that term, the extractive agriculture, because you're just taking, 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 as opposed to the regenerative where you're also giving back and really being a part of nature. Um, now you'd mentioned how you were sort of prescient in, in your book about what was ha about to happen with the whole COVID-19 pandemic. And um, we've learned a lot about our food system and sort of where it can break down and, and the weak links of the chain of the food system with, you know, and meat is, is part of that. Um, the system is really broken with a few big processing plants or a few big meat producers um, that if, you know, they sort of control a lot of what's going on, um, which is not a great system. So now that we, that's really been brought to the forefront with coronavirus, how do we get our way out of this? I mean, it certainly seems like this smaller scale regenerative agriculture is a path out of that, but can we do it? Yeah. So I think it's a mix of small scale and then, you know, midsize, which is very difficult to be because of land prices and everything. Um, but we need more regional hubs. We need more regional systems. And, you know, I was talking with Rob, I remember on a podcast like eight years ago about how I didn't understand why from a national security perspective, the government actually even allowed these big meat monopolies um, and produce monopolies too to happen. I mean, we we see it in the produce industry with um, 
you know, E. coli outbreaks on spinach. Um, we're going to see it soon with harvesting and our migrant workers who don't have great access to health care and live in cramped housing. Um, it's going to start to be a problem this summer. The reason why it happened to meet first was because we're currently not really harvesting much. Like the summer is, is just starting here. Um, uh, but actually in Europe, they they didn't have enough workers to harvest the asparagus a few months ago. And they were actually calling upon unemployed like engineers to just go out into the fields and, and start harvesting the asparagus because they didn't have people to do that. Um, and so we're going to see breakdowns in produce and in meat, but certainly it's quite dangerous and unhealthy for our whole um, food system to have only five meat packers um, in charge of the majority of our meat supply. Um, and, you know, they actually are making it very difficult for smaller and midsize, uh, meat producers to, 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 to book dates at slaughterhouses, for example, they'll block it all out so that small producers can't even book a date to get in there. Um, so there's a huge bottleneck right now at meat, at the meat processing plants. And it's hard for a farmer like us to, um, even get dates or, you know, right now, the place that we go is booked out for all of 2020. We have to book our dates for 2021 before these animals are even born. We have to have our dates booked. That's how tight it is here in New England with um, meat processing. And it, it's a huge stress, especially if somebody doesn't have large resources. So we need, we need small scale like us, but we also need this to be happening at a bigger scale as well. Um, and so that's why I was so excited about uh, the farm we visited in Chihuahua, because they're doing it at a big scale. And they can still do great grazing and great animal management um, before the animals go to a feedlot, if that's the next step for them. So I think there are hybrid ways of, um, of making sure the grazing while it's happening is good. Um, and so I think, you know, to, to, to say that, you know, we're all going to switch to hundred percent regenerative meat tomorrow is unrealistic and a fantasy. Um, but at the same time, I think that those, um, especially the folks in England who are recommending that, uh, we only eat plants and just rewild all of the countryside, that is really scary to me and, and, um, a complete fantasy. Yeah. So why, why, I mean, that was in the guardian, right? Is that part of what they were talking about in this recent guardian piece? So why is that so far fetched in, in fantasy? Uh, so in the film, we visited with James Rebanks, who is a sheep farmer in Northern, Eng in Northern England. And, um, you know, he puts it really well in the film where he talks about like, we need to admit that we're in nature and that we're actually part of nature and not a separate, separate entity from nature. Um, and there's people living there. So if we were to rewild everything, we would need to also put wolves back too. I mean, these animals, if we just had all deer and moose, uh, they would overgraze everything, take over everything. I mean, even in the small town where I live outside of Boston, we have a massive deer problem here. They're causing car accidents. They're eating all the habitat for ground nesting birds. They're a massive problem. There's a lot of sick deer around because there's no predators to call them. Um, but yet nobody wants hunters and nobody wants wolves. And so what are we going to do with all these deer? We're just going to continue to have more car accidents and less bird populations and just too many sick deer. Um, and so, you know, we have to instead understand that there's humans that actually live in rural America that are valuable to society. Um, and I think this gets to the polarization too, between like urban elite and sort of rural dumb farmers, you know, and, uh, so we have like this culture war happening between like, you know, enlightened environmentalists and, you know, rural folk who, um, are actually quite intelligent, really important to our society. And they can be, um, a really integral part of fixing our soil health and restoring land. If they're just given the economic opportunity to do that and the economic incentives to do that. Yeah. I think that's a great description of the different, the different polarized societies that it's the sort of urban elite, as you, as you call them, that are the environmentalists calling for, for no meat where they really have no idea what that would even look like or, or what that means for the, the rural communities that whose lives depend on this. So that's, you know, my, my kid's school, they, they have a, a little, a little garden and, um, that's a good start to learn about food, 
but I want them to have to like work on a farm, like you said, to volunteer at a farm, to know more about how a farm works and one with, with animals to see how animals can be humanely raised. I mean, I think we all need that type of experience. Um, and actually after watching the biggest little farm, after watching that documentary, it made me want to run out and start a farm. I mean, I was like so excited, uh, to see that. So I know in one of your, one of your previous books, you actually had sort of like a homesteading guide. So like a, a guide for how someone could start their own farm. Um, that seems like a great business opportunity as like a consultant to help people start farms. Like what, what kind of advice can you give somebody if they said, I want to run out and, and, and make use of my land and start growing things and see what I can do. What, what kind of advice could you give somebody? Yeah. So gardening is the number one hobby of Americans. And, um, I actually, um, was talking with a really great, um, agrarian scholar, um, uh, John Kempf, uh, who, uh, had this vision of this sort of alternative economy, right? So as, as the world gets more automated and as people become less and less needed as a full-time worker, right? We're going to, we're going to have people with more time on their hands basically. And we're going to have a lot more home gardeners, which, um, which by the way, I think is a good thing. And I think school gardens are good, but I also think they're a fantasy because people think that a garden is food production and that paints a really warped picture because we actually have to have animals in, in that mix too. It's not, act, it's, it's cute to have a garden, but that's, it's not actual real, you know, farming. Um, because you can just import all the manure and everything. You don't have to understand that, that, you know, animals actually had to be part of that system. Um, but he had this vision of, you know, all these folks kind of growing, you know, lots and lots of tomatoes and then sending them to a hub. And then you could, you know, go on to Uber, Uber produce and have a delivery of your tomatoes and then the carrots from the other guy, you know, and it could be this kind of really cool, like, um, gig, uh, economy, food system. Right. Um, so I think that that would be cool because right now, even, um, we have AI that can harvest raspberries. So that's something that's so delicate. So we, we have robots that can do that. So we're going to need less and less, um, manual laborers. We're going to need, you know, the, the economy is really going to shift and we're going to go into more AI and we're going to need to figure out what to do with humans. What are we going to do with all these people? So yeah, I have a book called The Homegrown Paleo Cookbook where um, I outline how to do basic homesteading, you know, if you want to keep bees or some backyard chickens or um, a whole section on growing vegetables, the family cow, all that stuff. But I also wrote it so that people could understand the right way um, so that when they went to go visit a farm, even if they didn't want to grow their own food, they would know what to look for. You know, you want to see the animals moving a lot. You don't want to see them in a stationary um, pasture for the entire season. And, um, in the film, we do a good job of explaining the difference between continuous grazing and then, um, adaptive multi-paddock grazing or mob grazing, but the idea that these, these animals are moving constantly. So everything needs to be moving constantly. Um, and, uh, so I think volunteering on a larger farm is the best way to learn. And, you know, at our farm, we take a limited number of work for share. So, you know, we have, you know, it's not just people who can't afford to share. It's people that want to be, it's a great sense of community. I know that, you know, CrossFit and other gyms, you know, that's one of their appeal, right? It's, 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 it's not just a workout, but you're part of a bigger community. And, um, our farm is really amazing because we have people from the left, people from the right, young, old, um, people volunteering because they just want to be involved in this and they want to learn how to do it. And they want to be exposed to people that aren't um, maybe people that they would talk to on an everyday basis. So I think you can learn not just about how to grow food on a farm, but also, um, you know, we have really deep conversations in the fields about um, everything, politics and just everything. So I think it's, um, it's really great to be part of a of an actual farm. So going down to, you know, the folks at, uh, biggest little farm, I'm forgetting what it's called autumn. So I can't remember. Um, and just asking if you can, you know, come on Friday afternoons and just help muck out the chicken houses or something like that. Yeah. I think that's, that's, that, that's so interesting to even think about. I mean, cause let's face it, there are a lot of people out of work right now, thanks to coronavirus and looking for something to do. And this could be 
a, a wonderful career change if you have access to land and if you you know if you can learn the skills. Um, I would be excited about that. I know that for sure. Yeah. Um, so let's get back to sort of the basics of regenerative agriculture again. So better for the environment, pulling carbon potentially out of the environment, storing it in the ground, better for the land, better water retention, better diversity. I mean, it all sounds so perfect. Um, but what do the detractors say? You know, what are the, what do some people say are the negatives about this or why it can't work or the challenges of it? So some people will say that it's, um, inefficient, um, because it requires more labor, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, it does take more time to move cattle instead of just like opening a gate and putting all your cattle in one fenced off area. Um, and you know, most farmers actually, you know, graze their cattle, but then have a job in town as well. So the idea of moving the cattle on a regular basis up front sounds like a lot more work, but what they're maybe missing is that their land will be more productive. They'll actually be able to increase their cattle herd and um, produce more, more meat, more make more money um, off that land. Um, and so uh, that's one of the criticisms. Another is scale, which we talked about. Um, you know, we need more demand, um, and and that will only come if people understand what they're paying for at the grocery stores and for the folks that can afford it to support it. So it needs to be supported. There's a reason why meat is so cheap. Um, and it's, uh, it's really too bad. Um, and so we need, you know, again, the folks who can afford it to, to support it. Um, uh, and also most of the major ag schools are not teaching these methods. So most of these land grant universities are teaching, you know, they're supported by Monsanto and other chemical companies. And so, um, you know, when, when students are doing their thesis um, and they need grant money to support their thesis, the grant money is coming from these chemical companies to test, you know, these different GMO strains of corn or something like that, instead of, um, you know, pouring more research into different forage mix that might, you know, maybe reduce enteric methane, um, so things like that, that we, that we studied at Michigan State with Jason Roundtree. Um, so we need more research going into the work that he's doing um, and others like him, the work that Frank's doing, um, you know, and Frank is a nice blend of, um, you know, he also understands the benefits of the industrial meat system, but understands also that it's got some, um, you know, animal welfare issues. And so to um, really have a lot more transparency, we've allowed the meat industry to be something that we don't want to see. And. Um, we just don't want to know about it. And so they've, they've been allowed to get away with the way they treat animals because we just didn't want to know. And so we need to make sure that they realize that we do want to know how they're treating their animals. And um, I'm on the board of Animal Welfare Approved, which is um, the highest standard of animal welfare um, it's, it's the highest level, but there's other great labels out there too. And people, if that's, you know, I did a survey of the folks that are following me and, um, ethical sourcing is the number one concern people have. So they want to know that those animals had a good life. Um, and, uh, so it might be different for, um, you know, a lot of other people, but we're, um, Rob and I actually, in addition to doing the film and the book, we came up with a course called Meat Curious uh, for folks that are um, either, you know, ex-vegetarian or vegan, or maybe they've cut down on their meat and they're worried about the health ramifications or the environmental ramifications, or maybe they're just really uncomfortable with how meat is raised and they want to do better. Um, and so we've actually um, developed a course that's going to um, be out when the book is out um, that actually walks people through and will teach them how to ethically source their meat too, because we know that that's the number one concern. Great. I, I mean, we need more voices like this. We need more education about this topic because it seems like there's such a strong push from the anti-meat community now that, and it's not a, the question of no meat or our current system, like, like the book shows, uh, like the documentary shows. So when are they coming out? How can people access them? Tell us, tell us more about that. So the book is available for pre-order now on all your favorite uh, online sources. And um, the book officially comes out July 5th, 
uh, 14th, Tuesday, July 14th. And for anyone that pre-orders the book, we're actually giving them um, a special sneak peek, sneak peek preview link to the film. So if they submit their um, just a screenshot of their receipt that they pre-ordered the book um, at sacredcow.info forward slash book, there's a link in there. Um, we, when the film is done, we will actually send them an early viewing, um, just like you got of the film. <laughs> yes. Um, and so, uh, and then everyone else can just, you know, keep updated, um, you know, via the website, sign up for the newsletter to find out when it comes out. I think the film will be done. Um, we just recorded the final narration. We have Nick Offerman as our, um, narrator, which is really fun. He's a huge supporter of the project. So for anyone who doesn't know who that is, it's Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec. Um, and so I think it's going to be done late July, early August. And so that's when folks will get their link. Um, and then for the rest of everyone else, um, it'll be available on like a mainstream, uh, you know, like streaming platform after that. Very good. Very good. Well, I'm excited to, to recommend this to everybody. I mean, really everybody needs to read this book and watch this documentary just to learn more about this discussion and to hear it from a, a very, uh, balanced and reasonable perspective, um, not a propaganda piece. And that must've been difficult as you were going through this. Cause let's face it, you know, documentaries are, I don't know. So many of them seem like they're 80% propaganda and 20% science, or I'm just pulling those numbers out of the air, but it certainly seems that way. And, and so making one, did you have to like continually check yourself? Like, am I questioning my beliefs? Am I turning this into a propaganda piece or is this really sort of based in reality? Is that something you had to continuously sort of refresh in your mind? Um, well, we don't pretend to be an objective documentary. I didn't, you know, interview a ton and ton of vegans, you know, and have, you know, vegan doctors, you know, in addition to the other health experts that are on there. I, all the health experts that we have are very pro meat, but interestingly, every single one of them had been a vegan before, um, everyone. And so actually at the end of the film, we were actually going to do this like montage of like Zoe Harkum, Chris Kresser, Mark Hyman, Rob Wolf. I mean, all of them saying like, I used to be V. I was a vegan too. I was a vegan for this many years and it destroyed my health in this way, you know, um, really, really fascinating. Um, in the book we did you question everything and check ourselves. Um, we're very upfront about our position um, that we, you know, Rob and I both found this diet uh, that we follow because of some health issues that we both had. Um, so he's celiac as well. And, and we just sort of realized that this way of eating is, is ideal for us. Um, but for example, when we were going through the literature on uh, grass fed meat versus feedlot beef um, and the, uh, the health differences, we didn't find huge differences between the two. And so um, there are minor differences, but that omega-3 uh, difference that a lot of people advocate for, um, when you really look at it in the context of an overall diet, didn't add up to much. Like just switching to grass-fed beef in the context of an overall crappy diet is not going to change your omega-3 status, right? The best way to do that would be eat less processed junk, and eat more real foods. That's how you're going to get more omega threes and less omega sixes. Um, and but we also in the film, you know, admit and in the book that you know some people do seem to do okay um, for a period of time on a vegan diet. Uh, but we also talk about there's a lot of genetic reasons why that might be. You know, some people can just convert beta carotene to retinol easier. They have a gene that can do that. A lot of people don't. Um, a lot of people you know, just have higher protein needs than others. Uh, their gut integrity is, is, I mean, I need a lot more protein than a regular person, but I don't necessarily, you know, the rest of my family maybe can eat a little more carbs and be okay. So, uh, we try not to be too zealot about any of these beliefs, but we do talk about the fact that humans are biologically omnivores and that, um, the optimal diet must include animal products as part of that and not from supplements. And to take in people's, you know, their, their desires, their likes, their cultural background. I mean, the one diet for all vegan diet for all just ignores all that. And I think you bring that up in your book as well, which is so important. All right. Well, well I know you've, you're busy. You've got a lot going on. I appreciate you taking the time uh, to sit down for this interview and I can't wait for people to get to read 
the book and watch the documentary and um and I think it's going to be very well received. So thank you for for putting all that time in to help spread this information and share it with the world. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your support. It's, it's great. Thank you.